to detect if each element is repeated in the array. First, let's look at, we want to check the, if the first element is repeated in the array, how many comparisons do we need? Good, n minus one. Very good, yeah. let's put there. If we find a repeated location, that we're done. Yeah, we just check element uniqueness. Let the problem to solve. Yeah, we find it. There is one element not unique. True false, right? Yeah, we want to return true false. Okay. Yeah, so you solve this. So you, you stop. You would like to check the second one. Okay. But, but if we fail, if we do not find repeated element for the first one, then we need to look at the second one. Similarly, for the second one, n minus two, and so on, right? So, yeah. Second to last one, one comparison. For the last one, we don't need comparison. So now you can see, if we write a pseudo code, running index from zero to n minus two, then, we need another inner for loop. Because we need to compare from the current location to all the elements after this location. So that's why we have an inner for loop and compare if the current element at the position i is repeated or not. If we don't do not find any equality in the middle, at the end, we will return true. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see this algorithm is very straightforward, but 
you want to see is ambitious, right? Based on our current procedure, after we solve a problem, we need to analyze its efficiency. Okay. So in the next slide, let's do efficiency analysis. First, base case efficiency. How many comparisons do we need for the oh, sorry, best case performance? Uh, best case efficiency. One. Yeah, the best case. These two are the same. That's the best case. And then we start to so return to two, right? So only C sub B and N equals one. Okay. Next, worst case efficiency. These two are the same. All the others is thing. Only the last two, only two. You know, when we reach the end, hold, you know, we need. Okay. So in this case, we have that number expression, worst case efficiency. Okay. After that, we also want to find Average case efficiency. Remember, that is another important because average case efficiency we needed to tell us the overall efficiency. So that's why it's important. The average case efficiency. So what is the average case efficiency? Not as easy as these two, right? The easiest. A little harder, but still not too bad. Okay? Yeah. But this is the hardest among the three, at least. Okay? Yeah. So I'd like you to try it. You try it by yourself as a practice exercise. Okay? And I can tell you at this point, I may leave this as a homework test for you. So I hope you already uh, saw my exercise set number one. So I posted 25 questions, and I also posted the answer yesterday. So that is, the answer is there, so you can study. Some of the questions are not very easy, but you can get a flavor of the homework assignment. Same format, same style, same way to do. Difficulty level also similar. Homework. Just exactly like a homework assignment, but yes, for this class, I plan to only give you three homework assignments. Three homework assignments correspond into three tests. So that's why the remaining give it as exercises. All right, yeah. I will. I plan to give you this question as a homework question. Pay some cost to organize there. Our method number two. This time we change the strategy. We want to pay some cost for we want to do some investment. That's our investment. We pay, but we have bigger gain. That's our strategy. Number two, investment in data structure. Okay, how do we make that investment? We organize our data. Okay, we sort the array first with certain costs. You need to pay the cost. Sorting that in array it is not cheap. Sorting that array, you need to pay significant cost. The question is, if your gain is bigger than the cost, if your gain is bigger than the cost, then we are willing to pay that cost. Okay. But at this point, we haven't learned many sorting algorithms. We only learned one, selection sort. The selection sort is not very good. The performance is not very good. Okay. Yeah. Later we will learn many more 
better solving algorithms with better efficiency. Okay. So here I can tell you later when we use some better solving algorithm, we can reduce the cost to n log n because the selection so the the growth function for the selection sort x squared. N squared. But here we know for the other better sorting algorithm, we can get to the n times log n function. Okay. So this part we will have more discussion later. We have a lot of discussion on sorting. And that's just the Yeah, so now try to figure out yeah, how do you how do you get that? Long story. <laughs> Question: How to check if an element is repeated in an ordered array? This time we have an ordered array. After we pay this high cost, pretty high, relatively high, this cost, we get an ordered array. Now let's solve that problem again. Element uniqueness problem on ordered array. This time, can we do much faster? Yeah, so this time, definitely, we can do much faster. Do you have any idea why we can do faster? You just have to do more tasks. Uh, the new students are less likely to write a lot of Yeah, right. Yeah. The, the key property, yeah. you already said that, you said one task. In our previous one, we have many passes. Nested for loop, this time one for loop. One for loop, for loop. That one, two, nested for loops. Okay? Yeah, that's the difference. But why this one, we can only use one pass? Because we have one property we can observe easily, one simple property, if, so think about this, if, if one atom is repeated, then we can find it, then we can find two of the adjacent elements that must be the same, right? If one element is repeated, so after we sort, we must have two of the adjacent elements equal. So we only need to compare two of the adjacent elements. Okay, two of the adjacent elements. Then one pass. Because one pass, we can compare all the two of the JSON element pairs, right? One pass, all of the JSON pairs, we can compare. Okay, done. So the pseudo code is like that. One pass, one for loop. No nested for loop. So you can see this is the game. After we pay that sorting cost, we reduce two nested for loops to one single for loop. That's the game. But next, we need to compare. So here, easily, you can see the number of comparisons. That number. What we need to calculate the overall cost you pay two costs, right? You need to add these two costs together as your total cost and compare with the method one. So in our method one, let's compare which method is better. Okay. Two methods, which one is better? The first one, the worst case function is this. Although another way to compare average case, right? Numbers, because here uh, we do not have average case, so let's compare worst case. Method two, worst case function is that these two functions. Now we need to compare which one is faster, worldly faster, the growth function. Yeah, last time we just learned. Growth function comes in. So what is the growth function of the method one? Growth function. 
of method one. Curve function. Look at the dominant term, then we do not look at the constant. Ignore the constant. What's that function? N squared. Good. What is the growth function of the second one? M of okay. So let's compare these two growth functions. <coughs> Which one growing fast? Oh, right. Yeah, it's definitely N squared, right? Yeah. So we, you know N squared. But mathematically, can we do some calculation mathematically to compare in general which one growing best? Okay? We use the ratio to compare two growth functions. That, that, that is the general method. Ratio of two, fun, two growth functions. We want to look at the limit of the ratio. When n goes to infinity, we want to look at that limit. What is that? The limit. After cancellation, we get the simplified limit. Do you know how to calculate this limit? How to calculate this limit? So here, I want to review calculus. Limit calculation a little bit. Calculus. Okay. How to calculate this limit? Uh, it is infinity, but how do we see it is infinity? We need to base on some rules, formulas, you know. Yeah. Yes, so that's why I need to review it. Yeah. Because we need a lot of calculations like that. All right, now let me show you some you know, different ways to see it. First, yeah, because here we do not see the base of the log, let's assume we use some general base, but it should be greater than one. If less than one is negative, so we want to, don't want to use the negative, no, negative log. We want to use the positive log function, not negative <coughs> log function, okay? So that's why we usually, the base, if you do not see, we assume it's a greater than one log base. Okay. All right. Now, method one, how to see? The method one, we do variable substitution. We try to see it using variable substitution. Let's use another variable u to represent this log function. Then, based on the definition of log, n equals a, the same base, exponential function. Okay? Yeah. So after this substitution, let's look at this limit again. This time, it's u variable goes to infinity. So how, how about the ratio of these two functions? The numerator is a an exponential function with base greater than one. Denominator is u, linear function. Or it is a polynomial. Okay. Exponential function, polynomial function. Linear polynomial function. Okay. And we know exponential function always grows much faster than polynomial function. You know, people always say it. so something is the exponential growth. You know, it means much faster. Exponential growth. Okay. Exponential function dominates any polynomial. Although we know that, but how do you prove it, right? How do you prove it? Next slide, I will prove it. We can prove it. Mathematically, 